Hey, Matthew chapter 1. Don't you like the Christmas season? I don't know about you, but I certainly do. I appreciate the opportunity. I'm glad that God, in His wisdom, decided for us to have seasons that kind of recur. And come, this is one of the things I've enjoyed since moving from uh, Long Beach, California, where we lived for 16 years, to the Midwest, is that we oftentimes, my wife and I discuss this, that we have, to, we have the opportunity to enjoy seasons. Uh, the four seasons of a year in Southern California, for the most part, you have one season, sunny and 70. You know, it's just about the way it is most of the time. And I enjoyed all 16 years of living there and didn't really think too much about it. Uh, but uh, coming back by the, uh, the Lord letting us to be here in Northwest Indiana, I enjoy every part of the year. I enjoy the summers, though they can be a little bit humid. And the state bird of Indiana, this mosquito bothers me a little bit there. But I enjoy the, the fall and where we are today in the, in the winter and the spring. And uh, thank God for the seasons. And I enjoy the fact that God brings us around to a time when we can celebrate uh, the coming of His Son. We don't know for sure that Jesus came in December. There's no Bible verse to tell us that. And, and most people believe it may have been in the spring of the year. I don't know. I don't know, but we do have the opportunity to recognize that globally uh, in the month of December. And December 25th being the day that we celebrate His birth, not necessarily the day that He was truly born uh, into the world, but is the day in which we can do that. And I'm grateful we can do it. Obviously, I preached a message on Wednesday night. And if you don't have that message, I hope you'll look it up. I think it'd be helpful learning the values of Christmas. Values change and people value things differently. I believe that I mentioned to you, I think on Wednesday night, that of course our Black Friday used to be on Friday and then it became 9 o'clock on, on uh, Thanksgiving night, then 6 o'clock and now it's 2 o'clock in the afternoon. I think next year it's going to be July 4th is when we'll start Black Friday. It just keeps backing up, backing up, backing up, and it becomes more and more commercial and more and more uh, musical, and everybody's doing different things. But, boy, I, I hope that you will not miss Christ in Christmas. We don't see anyone put X wean or X giving or X the fourth, but for some reason we put X Christmas. Let's get Christ out of Christmas. It's not hard to do. Even for those of us who call Jesus Christ our Lord, sometimes He's hard to stay on our mind. We can sing songs and give generous gifts and, and we can read the Bible and tell folks about Christ and be in a service all day Sunday. And some of us come in here, we have not yet thought about Christ even once. Now, I'm not here to criticize you. I'm just telling you that is, that's the truth. And it's been the truth in my life on Sunday mornings, even as a preacher of the gospel, that sometimes I have failed to give Christ the preeminence because the world doesn't like him. The Bible says the world hates him. He's very controversial in this world. No one gets excited. And, and, and one of the reasons I know he's the true God, no one goes out and cusses Buddha. I never heard anyone get, set, get mad and say, Mohammed, damn but they damn the God of the Bible. When people get mad, and when we've gotten mad, many of us have been guilty of saying, of all things we could say when we're angry, we could say Adolf Hitler or Joseph Stalin. We say Jesus Christ. We say his name. Why do you say that? Why does this world say that? Why they can't make a movie without damning his name? Even profane atheists will damn the name of God they say they do not believe. And they'll damn the name of Jesus, who they say they don't even recognize. Why is it? Because he really is the reason for the season. Christianity is about Christ. Christmas is about Christ. It ought to be about the Christ child. But you know, there's a purpose for him coming. He didn't come to build houses, to hang doors, to fix cabinets, to frame houses, and, and that's, that was a carpenter's shop. That's what he did as a, for a living for 30 years that he was here until he was uh, baptized and went about and picked 12 disciples and went on to the earthly ministry that God gave him for three and a half years before he was crucified. Against all contradictions, against all logic, 
He who did nothing but good got nothing but bad. But he didn't come uh, to enjoy this world. He didn't come to build houses. He came to give himself a ransom for you and I. The only way to heaven is Jesus. Every road of life leads to God. But only one road leads to eternal life, and that road is as narrow as the person of Jesus Christ. In a world of um, polytheisms and this God and that God, and you can make a God out of a doorknob if you want to, that does not agree with the God of the Bible. He said, Jesus is the way, he's the truth, he's the life. No man comes to the Father but by Jesus. Every road of life leads to God, but only one road leads to eternal life, and that is his Son, Jesus Christ. And he that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life, but the wrath of God abideth on them. I am so glad for the day that someone loved me enough to take the Bible and show me how I could go to heaven from here. And I'm glad that I explained to me clearly that I could not earn my way to heaven. To go to heaven, you can't earn it. The secret of eternal life is to learn that it cannot be earned. You can't earn your way to heaven. You're not good enough. I have a shirt on this morning that my wife ironed and prepared for me. I pulled it off a, off a hanger today and put it on. But if it had an ink mark on its left lapel here, just one small ink mark, I wouldn't wear it today. Most of the shirt is blue and clean, but if it had one black mark right here, I would just, I would refuse it. It's not good enough. It would bring attention. It's not, it's not ready to wear. Do you know, it doesn't matter if you're a good person or a bad person. You're full of such a, such a filthy lifestyle or you're someone that is a good upstanding person. You cannot prance your way into God's presence on your own righteousness. You're kidding yourself. You're whistling the wind. You're drinking your bath water. To think for a moment that you can go to heaven by being good. If I could go to heaven by being good and not doing bad, then why would Jesus have to die on the cross? Why would we need a Savior if we can earn it on our own? That's the story of Christmas. That is an opportunity. I love Christmas for many reasons. I thank God for, uh, for uh, being brought up in a home where they valued the Christmas season. And I'm grateful for that. I'm glad that we did many times of Christmas caroling. We had Christmas programs. But I love to be with the family. We're glad to have our son Derek visiting with us uh, for a few days here in, in, uh, in, 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 in preparation for Christmas. He won't get to come for Christmas, but we look forward to having him now. And I love bringing the family together. I enjoy caroling. I enjoy the opportunity to exchange gifts to friends and loved ones. And I enjoy the Christmas Eve service where we'll come and partake of the Lord's Supper and remember the Lord Jesus the way he ought to be remembered. I enjoy being with God's people, singing the songs. But I love Christmas because also... I can demonstrate God's purpose to other people who don't know him yet. See, eternal life comes in knowing that Jesus is the way to eternal life. Number two, knowing that eternal life is a gift. It's not a reward for being righteous. It's a gift for being guilty. Most of the world does not understand. I didn't understand that. I'm so glad someone took time to explain to me that I could not earn eternal life. I needed to accept it as a gift. I didn't understand that, and I'm glad that now I know that. But at the Christmas season, I can share with others the gift of eternal life. I can share with them. I loved uh, the fact that our congressman today came up and said, Merry Christmas. Amen. Sometimes you're nervous when people say that to you nowadays. We're so used to happy holidays. I'm so glad we can say that, and we ought to use biblical terms when we say that. But I'm glad, too, that I can really talk about Christ and get into, I've, I've given these little uh, brochures out throughout the community. I gave some more out this morning. I plan to give some more out in our neighborhood and invite our friends. We have just a week or so to do that. I want to make sure that every one of the people that I know and love has an opportunity to know about that. If they can't come, they can read in the back the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hope you'll use that opportunity. But I want us to look at the Christmas story from Matthew. The Bible gives us the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those are the four first books of the, of the New Testament. 
And each of them have a specific um, angle that they're looking at. All of them are about Jesus. Each of those four men, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, are describing Jesus, but with a different paradigm. Matthew is saying Jesus is the king. And he gives his lineage on his father's side. Mark shares with us that Jesus is a servant. There's no lineage. He's a servant. He is doing things. All the book of Mark, all 16 chapters, you find him doing this and doing this and serving here and going this way and in a hurry and immediately and straight forth. The book of Luke, he's the son of man. There's where we get his mother's side. We get his mother's lineage in the book of Luke. And it's the longest book. It was written by a physician. Luke, the physician. And it tells us the other part, the mother's side of the Christmas story. There's where most of us refer to that. In the book of John, he's God. And we, t we learn that he is from the beginning. He always was. He always will be. He became flesh at Christmas time, when he came as an infant, God, the Word, became flesh and dwelt among us. And he had to come. And remember, we'll learn this in just a few moments. We look at this passage of Scripture. But Matthew tells us that he's the king. And he gives us a lot of information. Let's look back at our passage of Scripture. Thank you for looking at it with me. Verse 18. <coughs> Verse number 18, the Bible says this. Now, the birth of Jesus was on this wise, in this fashion. This is kind of how it happened, and it's going to be very general because really, the birth of Christ has very little information in our Bible. What we know, and it's been magnified much, you know, of course, as you see about the innkeeper, you know, the innkeeper becomes the person, but this Bible says there's no room for him in the inn. There's not really an innkeeper that said, no, you can't stay here. They were born, he was born in a barn because there was, it was a crowded place and, and this humble couple could not find a place in the inn. But we, we, we see it magnified, but really there's not a lot about the birth of Christ because Jesus' birth is not as magnified as his death. He was born to die. Can you say that with me? He was born to die. Die And then to be buried and rise again, that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. But there are wonderful truths we can learn. Matthew chapter 1 verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus was on this wise, or this is how it kind of happened. When as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, espousal in the, in the, old, in the Bible, it, is, it was kind of like what, what would happen, like our engagement in the Western world, but it was far more, um, the espousal time is where they actually did their vows. They made their commitment. They were married at a spousal, but they would not come together physically until uh, he had a home prepared for them, for his wife, and they would go, he, would, he, would, he would make arrangements. They would say their vows, and then he would go away and prepare a place, just like Jesus does for us. He came, he died for our sin, he made a promise that he would save us. If we'd accept the promise, he would save us. And then he's gone away and to prepare a place for us, he'll come back again, much like the marriage in, um, in, in the old Eastern, Eastern time. So they would already made commitments. They'd already had a family gathering. He had already promised Mary that he would be her, would be her, his, uh, her husband and she his bride. So that had already taken place. He'd already been espoused. And now, though, he finds out something that happens. Before Mary was espoused to Joseph, verse number, verse number 18 again, before they came together and she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. In Luke chapter, chapter 2, you'll find the story of that. And then uh, Joseph, her husband, being a just man, not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. Privately. So what happens here? The, of course, they're 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 getting ready for their wed their their consummation. They've already had their vows. They're looking forward to going and getting each other. And in talking with each other, Mary tells Joseph that she's expecting a baby, but she's not been with another man. And Joseph does not understand that. He has not had that, at this point, that conversation with the angel. Most likely Gabriel spoke, spoke to Mo, Mary, probably the same. The, we don't know that for sure, but probably Gabriel came to, to Joseph. But this time he doesn't have the information. All he knows is that the girl he had made a promise to that he has not been with yet tells him that she's going to have a baby. 
And then she tells him a wild story. That this baby was conceived by the Holy Ghost. The Spirit of God planted the seed inside of her. And the angel of the Lord told her that she would bear the Christ child. This is the virgin birth. Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14, the Bible tells us, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. This is the Christmas story, and, and it talks about the, the doctrine of the virgin birth. Liberals do not believe in the virgin birth. They doesn't matter. They don't believe that that miraculously happened. But the Bible teaches it happened, and it's very important that it happened. You know, the virgin birth teaches us a very important thing. We get our bloodline from our Father. And if Jesus would have been the son of another man, and all of us are sinners... None of us are innocent. All of us have done things we shouldn't do. We've said things we shouldn't say. We've thought things we shouldn't think. And no one had to teach us to do that. It came by nature. My wife and I, we have nine children. And I love those kids, but I have never had to teach them how to lie, how to disobey, how to lose their temper, how to be lazy. They've learned that all on their own. Do you know how they do those things? They got me in them. And I got my dad in me. And he's got his dad in him. And all the way back to Adam, when Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden, so then death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. This is why everybody needs a Savior. But had Jesus had a human father, then Jesus would have been a sinner. And if he had been a sinner, he couldn't save you or me. I could die on the cross, but it wouldn't save you or myself. You could die on the cross for somebody else. You wouldn't be able to save him because you're in the same boat everyone else in humanity is. Jesus had to be born without a human father. He had to have a miraculous birth. And God who created the world, who created uh, you and I, knew that we would have to be the innocent dying for us, the guilty. In the Lord Jesus Christ. Well... Joseph has heard the story by Mary as she explains to him, but I don't think he believes it. He is thinking, I'm going to have to get a divorce. And at this time, it was a big deal. It was a big deal, and it was something that was publicly done, and Mary would be publicly shunned. Today, divorce is not as, <coughs> as a negative thing as, as many places, and even in our history. But in this time... To do what Mary supposedly had done was just unthinkable. And she was not going to be able to get by with this. But he, being a just man. By the way, I think we need a revival of just men. Of men and women who will treat. And the word just means to treat our fellow man correctly. Micah chapter 6 and verse number 8, the Bible tells us this statement. That God has showed the old man what is good and what the Lord doth require of thee. But to do justice, justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. I'm glad that Joseph was a just man. I wonder how you would have handled that, sir. I wonder how I would have handled that. Would I have handled this in a just way? You know, he had a reputation far beyond this time that he would handle things justly. And the Bible tells us that, that he was a just man, not willing to publicly embarrass Mary, even though he thought that she had been guilty of adultery. But he decided, if I do put her away, if I do divorce her, I'm going to do it privately, privately, so as not to add more insult to injury. How do you handle things when you have been abused? When you have been taken advantage of? When someone owes you? How do you, do you jump to conclusions? Do you handle things? Do you get on the phone or do you get on the text? Do you get on the email and tell people how you think about things before you even know? And you know, there is a verse of scripture that love covereth what? A multitude of sins. A tailbearer, he tells everything. You know, there's some things we say, friend, and when you, when you get ready to say something, think about the think acrostic, T-H-I-N-K. Number one, is it true? What I'm going to say, is it true? Number two, if I say it, will it be helpful? 
Number three, will it be inspirational? Will it help somebody? The Bible says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good for the use of edifying, building up. You know, sometimes we are happy when you walk in the room. Sometimes we're happy when you walk out. And usually that's determined whether or not you inspire, you encourage, you instruct, or do you tear down? Do you drain? You know this. I've had friends. You've had friends. And I may have been a friend like this that brings, that just drains a relationship. Always negative. Always needy. Always wanting. Always complaining. You know what? You'll find yourself, you'll find yourself sitting alone one day wondering why no one wants to be a friend with you. Learn to edify and encourage. Is it true? Is it helpful? Is it inspirational? Is it needful? There are some things that are true. They're not needful to be said. And you know what will make the, make the decision on that? How much love you have for God and for others. Someone who loves deeply is careful what they say about other people. And then K, is it kind? I'm glad that, that, that we have an example in Joseph of someone who was a just man. He, didn't, he, he loved her. He was confused as a termite and a yo-yo trying to figure out what has just happened. My whole life is all messed up here. I have, got, I have, an, I have, an, I have a spouse. I'm going to have to put her away. Then notice the next thing the Bible tells us. Look at verse number 20. And I want you to read it out loud with me. Would you read it? Everyone together. Verse 20. But while he thought in these things, Thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife. He goes on to tell him, and, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. An interesting thing, too, about this is that while he thought on these things, you know, we have lost the, the, the attribute and the strength in our society oftentimes of meditation, of thinking. We're so stimulated. We walk in our homes, they find the remote control. Boom. I've just got to have noise. We get in our car, we can't even sit by ourselves. We've got we've to turn on. And I'm this way. They say we look at our phones 50 and 60 times a day. We're, we sit and we just, we, we got our, all our family around us and we're all just. I was watching a, at a basketball game this week and I was watching the young teenagers watching the, uh, the basketball game. And I was amazed how many kids were on their phone during a basketball game. Watching that, we're so stimulated by things that we don't take time to ponder. One of the things I love about Joseph, and while he thought on these things, Mary, and while she pondered all these things in her heart. I want to encourage you, this Christmas season, why don't you take a few, few, a few hours and ponder and think. And turn off your phone and turn off your television, turn off your radio and sit <coughs> and ponder. The other day I, I, um, I had set a fire in the fireplace and I love that, I love that uh, thing. It's something somewhat therapeutic for me after a long day to put a fire in the fireplace and watch it go. But uh, it, was, it was burning down and I was getting tired and I went and one of our boys went down and they sat in the chair that I like to sit in right in front of the fire where you can feel the heat and you can see the crackling and, and watch the flame and some just a place to think. And, um, and one of our boys sat down there and my wife said to me upstairs, she goes, did you send him to bed? I said, no. I said, uh, I said so-and-so, he's down by the fire just sitting and watching the fire. And she said, oh, he needs to go to bed. I said, you know what? I like the idea that he's just sitting there thinking. Without an iPod, without, an I, without a computer, without a television, without a radio, he's just sitting there looking. Let's let him sit and look at the fire. Maybe there's some pondering things that can go on in his heart and life. I'm glad we have an example of someone like Joseph who thought. Are you a thinker? Are you someone who ponders things? Do you know God has got a thing going on in this world and I don't understand everything? His ways are higher than my ways and his thoughts and my thoughts. But you know what? There is understanding that comes from people when you read your Bible. Some people don't do this. They just read their Bible. They read their verse of the day. They read their chapter. 
They, they, they pray, and they say, well, I'm done with that. Well, I want to take on my day. You know, there's a blessing when people come to meditate on the scriptures. Think about it. Ask yourself, what does God want me to learn the Bible? Is there a lesson to learn? Is there a promise to claim? Is there a principle to practice? Is there a sin to avoid? Why did God put that in the Bible for me? And close your mouth for a second and think. And ponder. You know, Joseph gives an example of someone who pondered these things. He thought about those. And while he was thinking, God gave him a message from the Lord. We'll talk about that in weeks to come. But this morning, I want, to, I want to leave and just say this with you if I can. The reason for Christmas is Christ. Make sure you don't go through Christmas without Christ. As a child of God, but especially if you're here today, you're not sure if you died, you'd go to heaven. Don't leave this room without Christ. In 150 years from now, all that's going to matter is where you live. It's not going to matter where you lived here. It's not going to matter what you drove. Because you are going to separate from that body. And you're either going to live with God forever in heaven or without him forever in the lake of fire. You have a short time to decide where you're going to spend eternity and what you're going to do with Jesus. This week I stood at the bedside of a man who in just a few moments would go into eternity. And on... Saturday, they'll put his marker, they'll put his body in the ground, and they'll come along in a few weeks and put in a grave marker, and they'll have his name, and have his birth name, his birth date, and they'll have his death date. In between, they'll have a dash. You know, that little dash is a small punctuation, but you know what it says? What you do with Jesus in that dash determines where you spend eternity. Make sure that you've accepted Jesus. Don't, don't accept baptism. It cannot save you. This morning, probably people get baptized. That water cannot wash away your sin. It's not the day you get saved when you get baptized. Don't take church membership, sacraments, communion, things that we do for God. Those are all good and well, but none of those can give us eternal life. Only Jesus can. Make sure that you don't, you get that settled. Make sure that, that Christ is your Savior. He came to save people from their sins. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the joy of being able to be with church family members this morning. Thank you for the attention in this room. I pray you please help us as we dismiss in just a moment, but as we handle some spiritual business in the meantime, give us the mind of Christ. Thank you for listening. With heads bowed and eyes closed, it's not a time to leave unless you're, you're sick. Please just stay for a second. How many would say this morning, Pastor, I don't know a lot about a lot of things, but I do know this. I know if I die today, I'd go to heaven. I know when and where it was that God took my sin and I took his son. And I could tell you, if we talk together, Pastor, I could tell you when that was. Would you raise your hand if you know that? Hold it up high and rejoice with the Lord. Good, you may put your hand down. Maybe there's others that would say, Pastor, I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure if I did die today, I'd go to heaven. I am concerned about it. Please, please pray for me. If there's someone like that this morning in the balcony, would you raise your hand and say, Pastor, pray for me. I'm not sure if I die today, I'd go to heaven. Please pray for me. In the balcony, hold your hand high. Anyone like that? God bless you. God bless you. Anyone else? God bless you, sir. Thank you. Anyone else? Hold your hand high in the balcony. Say, Pastor, please pray for me. I'm not sure if I died, I'd go to heaven. Thank you for your honesty. How about on the main floor? You want to say, Pastor, I'm not sure if I died today, I'd go to heaven. I'm not sure where I'd be 150 years from today. I can't honestly tell you that. Could I encourage you to let someone? You have to overcome pride and procrastination to get the answer to that. Let someone take the Bible and show you how to be saved. Anybody like that this morning on the main floor? Say, Pastor, please pray for me. I'm not sure if I die today, I'd go to heaven. Please pray for me. Hold your hand up right now, would you? Anyone like that? Let me pray for you. God bless you, ma'am. Anyone else? God bless you, sir. And God bless you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am, I see you. Anyone else? God bless you. Anyone else? Thank you and thank you. If you're here this morning, you're not sure if you died, you go to heaven. Please don't go away without Jesus. 
He loves you. He can pay for your sin. Here's my encouragement to you. If you raised your hand a moment ago, as soon as we stand in a few moments, there'll be folks coming, maybe some to pray, some to, to help. But if you would like to know for sure if you died, you go to heaven, I want to encourage you to come. In the balcony, you can come down the steps. On either side, we'll welcome you there. If you're on the main floor, you can come. Let someone take the Bible and show you how to be saved. Let someone explain that to you. It's life's most important question. Maybe you've already been saved and you need to be baptized. Let's do that this morning. Maybe it is that you just say, you know what? I don't want this Christmas to come without me making much of Christ. Let the Lord help you in that way. Let's stand to our feet, can we?